I'm Indy Nidell, and this is the Great War special episode from Bolimov in Poland, where I sit here in Krzeszło Mądrości and talk about World War I archaeology with two World War I archaeologists. And these two gentlemen are those World War I archaeologists. Now, could you briefly introduce yourself and say a little bit about uh, yourself? Hello guys, I'm Andrzej Pewniak and I'm the archaeologist of the First World War. Hi, I'm Tomek Myśliwiec, I'm also archaeologist and philosopher. Okay, now, we, we're here in Bolimov visiting you because this is where you're working. You're excavating and working here. Why Bolimov? What significance does Bolimov have to the First World War? I already know the answer, but I want you to tell them. Yeah, the significance is uh, that the Bolimov uh, is the place where the Germans first time used uh, gas on the Eastern Front. Uh, and uh, it was uh, four attacks, uh, first in the January 31 in uh, 1915. And it was the um, xylyl bromide with uh, dianizidine, it causing uh, um, sneezing and tears. So it wasn't anything like you know phosgene gas or anything. No, like no, 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 no. It's something like uh, just to um, disable uh, the enemies. Okay. And uh, the other attacks uh, was in May thirty-one, uh, in twelve June. Yeah. And the seventh of July. And uh, th those three attacks with uh, was uh, with the uh, chlorine gas. With chlorine gas. Yeah. Now um, the first attack, though, uh, at the end of January. Now that failed, right? The, the the gas it was too cold and it failed to release. Yes, uh, the, mm, this gas uh, not seems uh, work very well, uh, but um, there was a situation like the German has captured the first Russian lines, yeah. and uh, in the trenches where the were fires. And the fire uh, has, uh, due to um, higher temperature, oh, yeah. uh, caused this gas uh, works better. And the Germans suffered themselves from their gas. From their own gas. Yes, and only volunteers uh, are uh, stayed at these trenches, at these trenches, and other has just come back. And that was something I actually did not know about that. So I'm very glad we came yeah. here today for that. Now, of course, that was not the first time anyone used gas during the war. The French first used tear gas as far back as August. Yeah, in front, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just tear gas. And we didn't, get to, it was, we didn't get to the really poisonous gases till later in 1915. Um, now, what exactly do you do? I mean, people watching, they're, they're going to know what archaeologists do, they're going to know they dig. So are you just digging for artifacts or what, how would you describe what your, what your actual work is here? Well, uh, we are not just digging. To be honest, the digging is the last thing we are doing. Okay. And we are starting from collecting all kind of data about this battle in many types of sources. So there we have uh, diaries and chronicles of, of uh, regiments. And of course, the data that we produce, for example, by using LiDAR uh, laser scanning of the terrain surface and any other kind of data. Now the diaries, um, which is interesting you meant that, because it just suddenly struck me. When you're reading, are these Polish soldiers' diaries, or do you read find diaries from the Germans or the Russians, or, I mean, since Poles fought on well, both sides? Well, all diaries which we can get and which concern about this battle. Uh, in our teams are also historians who, who are uh, specialists in, in this period and this, uh, this battle. Why did you guys choose world, just World War I archaeology? I mean, uh, you said that you actually studied as a medievalist, and right. when you, like, same as me, when, when I was younger, and I ended up working <laughs> on the First World War just like you. So is there any specific reason that drove either of you to just the First World War? Or? Um, well, I don't know really, because it's really, really interesting. Um, any types of archaeology and any other periods that are uh, well worked out, Right, mm -hmm. in archaeology. And First World War is quite unknown. And I think it's not only in Polish, but also in other, uh, other countries too. I think you're very right, which is one reason we're doing this show. And also, there was a heck of a lot of digging in the ground going on in World War I, right, possibly, right, 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 which uh, right. you didn't see in a lot of earlier periods. So, you go through, you read the war diaries and chronicles and regimental histories, and you figure out. Um, so. Had you specifically said, we're going to go to Bolimov, 
and that's the next place on our list? Or did you, I mean, did you pick this before you started reading up about it? Or had you been reading up about different things and thought, hmm, now Bolimov sounds interesting. I mean, why did you focus in on just Bolimov? Well, uh, I think this is the question which you should ask, not us, but our <laughs> professor, Dr. Oh, okay. Anna Zaleska. Yeah. Right? Uh, she is specialist, one of the specialists in modern archaeology and uh, archaeology of First World War. Yeah. And she just have uh, mm, some idea just to explore such things like we because, have here. Um, the First World War was never uh, explored in the Poland uh, before. So this, this is, is, the first is the first research because, as uh, the Tomek said, uh, First World War is uh, not very uh, popular in Poland yeah. because there was no country like Poland because we have, have been occupied by the German, Austro, Hungarians and Russians. Lucky you! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, and so people have no many knowledge about the, this this war, and we starting to research it, and it could be a milestone. I think so too. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to see some of the stuff that you were doing today. Can you tell them a little bit about your methods? I mean, if it's just one excavation, or you have several excavations, or how you decide specifically where, just things that they might not know about how the archaeologists actually work in the field. Right. Well, we will have uh, several excavation sites and they are departed between uh, the forest and the field ones. Uh, because here in Bolimov are the Bolimov forests and it's preserve of nature uh, in which the uh, trenches and dugouts and all those stuff from the war still is in terrain. It's, and it's pretty incredible, easy. you know, when you think about right. it. And after 100 years, it still stays and is able to, we are able to get inside the dugout or to walk through the trench like we do this day, right? And the others, uh, other kind of our sites are the uh, sites laying on the agricultural fields, which are in some specific uh, aspect better preserved than those uh, put to the forests. Here are many things, but they are not uh, visible uh, on the surface if we did not uh, excavate it. And if we did not uh, see this, then no one else could see it, right? So uh, this is a promise of that we can find, uh, well, we can obtain good results here in this place. Now, how would this be different from what we saw in the forest? Well, um, in forest we see the uh, structures that are visible in terrain, right? Yeah. Here you are nothing visible because it's an agricultural field. Right. Here you have a piece of wood which uh, could be an uh, element of the uh, wall, trench wall. Uh -huh. Or it could be something else. It also could be, a, you know, a door, for example, oh. uh, stolen from one of the houses and used in the... Uh, dugout. Okay. Uh, the door of the dugout. So, um, and uh, how big a team do you have? How do you put this together? How do you actually get it started? Uh, our project has 10 uh, constant members and uh, co-investigators okay. and uh, some co-workers. Uh, the amount of which is uh, increasing on the, or decreasing, it depends on, on the season or on the and, well, tell us about some of the things that you found. I mean, what kind of stuff is down there in the, in the old trench networks? Uh, well, we can find all stuff that is related to the First World War. Okay, so um, you'll, find, you'll find maybe a gun, maybe ammunition, shell casings, yeah. and somebody... It is possible to find all of that. And also some kind of personal uh, objects of, of fallen soldiers. Yeah. And of course, including um, dead soldiers too. You'll find the re remains of the soldiers and bones. How does that, that feel is. when you find it? Well, the for archaeologists it's normal, but uh, yeah. for other people it could be shock. But it yeah. would surprise me if I was doing anything and I found it. For dead example, soldier. in the no man's lands, uh, in no man's land, uh, we can find uh, uh, human re remains, but uh, for example, one leg and two arms and one head or and what, whatever. Is it, is it just? the bones at this point after 100 years? Or is it yes, more? yes. Okay. So we are now on the second, the Russian line, and uh, you could see a white trench. 
with wood survived in these trenches, uh, which prevented uh, ground to fall into the ground, fall into to the trench. So Germans was uh, there, this side. To be honest, it's uh, the, this place we, we chosen, was chosen for excavations because of the bone remains. They are not humans, but we don't know before because there's very uh, slow, little piece of, of the bone. So only after anthropological analysis you could say that it's human or not human. And all around still are laying human remains. Last year we found uh, two legs and there we have any uh, another uh, dig site also is last year when we have a Russian sub and uh, a rifle shooter position connected with very short uh, communication trench with the fire trench and inside was the grave and it's a grave of uh, at least seven people seven soldiers but they are not complete there are you know in one uh, one part of this 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 grave was only skulls and only legs in the other part and only hands in the other part yeah. and no spinal cord no ribs no something nothing like that so we interpret it like a, a process of uh, cleaning the no man's land because of uh, of, of uh, disease disease right yeah. and uh, people who do that I think they just put out only this what they could put out so hand uh, or head or leg or something and all this uh, stuff from the, the, the inside body just lay this uh, still in in the field oh, wow and we are finding here many remains many many and no one is complete yeah. no, no other. Well. and and how do you go about you know obviously i've seen you out with the with the big shovels and stuff removing removing the dirt but how do you go about excavating without damaging things that are in the ground i mean how how difficult is it to be careful how slowly do you go and how how does it work well i think it's just a matter of, 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 of doing that. Uh, we are professionals, we are doing just... I mean, it's something you've been trained to do. Uh, you know? so it's just an archaeological job, right? like uh, making a TV show is quite normal for you, right? Yeah. Of course, when we find uh, that soldiers, we are very careful and uh, it, this process is very slow to, to um, discover the old skeletons. The difference, uh, how to, uh, how to um, see where is the trenches or where is the dark out, uh, we can see on the ground because the darker colors are, uh, the, there are the objects uh, like, the, for example, dugout or the trench. And uh, over it, it's in uh, light uh, colors, uh, so it, uh, it's, why, why is it darker? I mean, obviously it's been filled in over the years and stuff, but, uh, but uh, is it because it's been filled in with topsoil or why, why, are, why are the colors different? Because natural colors are light okay. and when somebody dig there, uh, after years it becomes dark. Okay, so once you've found uh, the, the area that you're going to do the excavation on, uh, how big are these areas? I mean, is it, is it, you know, is it 200 meters by 300 meters? Is it 10 by 15? How do you decide how much you're going to mark out and dig? And how do you mark it out? How do you do the action? Uh, well, we are depending on our uh, previous surveys, so for example, geophysicals uh, okay. or, or for LIDAR. And uh, I think there is no, no possibility to open the, the, the trench, the ditch that are a few hundred meters long. Right. Uh, okay. It's rather 10 or for 15 meters long and few or dozen meters uh, wide. Uh, and that's all. Do you think this now, with working specifically with World War I archaeology, do you think that's something you guys will be continuing for years? Or do you plan on you know, spreading out and burying it? You know, I might do other documentaries. You know. <laughs> I don't know uh, for yet because our project will be will take place this year and next year also, okay. and then we will thought about uh, writing something new, something other project, maybe uh, related to first world war. All right. Well, that's very interesting. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for for, for, for joining us. Wait, hang on. Um, and it was Krzeszło Mądrości. What? Krzeszło Mądrości. Krzeszło Mądrości. Okay.
Well, thank you very much for joining me here in Kshishwa Montrojti. Um, and it was a lot of fun having you guys, okay? I'm thank sure you. we'll see you again. I'm thank sure. you. See you next time. See you guys. <laughs> That's it for today. If you'd like to see our special about the first poison gas attack at Bolimov, you can click right here for that. And like us on Facebook for great things to waltz into your life. See you next time.